And good evening. Welcome to our midweek service. We are glad to have each and every one of you with us here tonight. As we get started, would you stand? Stand and sing, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, I'll Be There, I Know I Will Be. I hope you will be as well. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Sing with me tonight. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saints of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. The roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder i'll be there great way to get started this evening go ahead and be seated if you would how about when we all get to heaven what a day what a day of rejoicing that will be sing the wondrous love of jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory you know, the reality is this next verse. Sometimes as we walk that pilgrim pathway, what does happen is clouds. They, they fill the sky. But one day that will be over and we'll be able to say, when we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. What an awesome outlook we can have as Christians. On this next verse. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, Clouds will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory great singing this evening let's close for now with face to face think of that day meeting our savior the one who died willingly gave himself as a sacrifice for me one day i shall see him face to face what a glorious day that will be face to face with christ my savior face what will it be when with rapture I behold him Jesus Christ who died for me face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by face to face oh blissful moment face to face to see and know face to face with my Redeemer Jesus Christ who loves me so face to face I shall behold him far beyond the 
starry sky Face to face in all His glory I shall see Him by and by Wonderful singing tonight. Pastor Scudder, please come. Amen. Well, good to see all of you. Welcome to our midweek service. We are excited about all the things that are always happening. Never, never slows down around here, does it? And of course, the banquet, the mother and daughter banquet was just fantastic. Uh, I would estimate 100 hands probably were raised for salvation. And uh, we know that was a lot of work. You all did great uh, to to have uh, people that you're ministering to and having sit with you and talk to them and, and share the Lord. Uh, and so we are still going to be inviting those that came to a series that I started last Sunday, but they can still come. We still have invite cards. The series is, What is My Value? And a lot of people struggle with this, and they put their value into things that really don't give them value, and uh, they're missing the big thing. And so we're going to do that again this Sunday. It's also Palm Sunday. And this would be a great Sunday for you to invite people to come out to this series. Again, we have invite cards, and I'd like to have our ushers, and if we don't have enough ushers, uh, to add some to the mix to hand these out at the end of the service. Uh, So ushers, be by the doors with this card, What is My Value? And then also this one, which is our Easter invite card, which is the following Sunday. It's hard to believe that we're so close to Easter, and, and that'll be exciting. Uh, So invite people out. Both of these cards have the gospel, so it's a great way to share the gospel. Even if they don't come to one of these services, uh, we once uh, once Sunday comes, these we throw away. So don't don't waste the Lord's money. Uh, Make sure you take a few of these and hand these out, and then the Easter ones as well. That would be uh, wonderful. Also, uh, we are excited because we have a couple things that. Uh, we've, we're just starting. One is when we were at the National Religious Broadcasters, we were meeting with Moody Radio, and we're on Moody Radio Chicago on the weekends, and Cleveland every day, and Florida every day, and we're looking at another Florida station. Um, and then we're on their, their network feed, so all of their stations can pick, them, pick us up. And it was the first time that we've ever sat down with all of their station managers, and that was really good to talk with them and and strategize a little bit, and they really promoted us. In that meeting, one of the station managers said, hey, if you would produce a one-minute little devotional, we'll put that on for free. And so we started producing those. It's taking, of course, time to to take our devotionals, to write them um, for one minute or less, and then I have to read them all. But you'll start hearing that. I think it's already on Moody Chicago. So if you, any of you listen uh, during the day, let us know if you hear those. It's called Moment in Grace, and you'll be hearing those Monday through Friday. We're going to be adding a weekend one, and then we're going to also uh, give that to all the different stations. We have over 300 stations uh, that currently air in grace. We're going to hand those to everybody so that they might use that. We have another couple exciting in grace television programs going out. We had, by the way, three saved on the phones today during our TBN broadcast. And uh, we're also excited because we're releasing not only the Discover Hidden Israel 5 series, which uh, you can watch all those on YouTube now, but also we have a couple that are just for YouTube. One is with Dr. Andrew McIntosh, the British engineer and professor. You all remember when he came and he spoke about the ear? Well, we also filmed an episode with him about the ear. And it's really, really good because the, the editors added all of the graphics and stuff. And so you'll see that one coming out soon. We also just released today one with a, uh, a man who is a Levite who is writing music and singing music. He wants it to be for the Jewish temple, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And so uh, watch for that interview. His name is Yair Levy. And we're also going to be interviewing him in Israel at some of the sites, the Temple Mount and other places like that, as uh, he's very excited about singing. Can you imagine if he really is one of the ones, or maybe the leader of the choir or of the music for the temple? So anyways, these are exciting things that are coming out on In Grace. 
So pay attention to that, that as well. We're getting close to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, which we need to pass that threshold. That's a very important threshold for us. And then once you get to that, it, it gets faster and faster. So if you all want to pray about that, we appreciate that. Also, um, I told you that when we were at the Religious Broadcasters that I met, again, the brother-in-law of one of the hostages that we've been praying for. The hostage is Amri um, Moran, and so we want to continue to pray, and I'll pray again for him and all the hostages and for Israel uh, tonight. And uh, they're going into, I think on Saturday, the Purim uh, holiday, the celebration of how God protected Israel from annihilation, uh, from Haman's wickedness, and so we're going to be celebrating that on Sunday, this coming Sunday at our Thrive at Five service. And the kids are welcome to come dressed up. I know our grandkids are all excited about being Esther or Mordecai. And uh, there's also our audience participation. I guess you get to boo um, Haman and cheer the heroes of the story. It's basically going to be a read-through of the Esther story. And then afterwards, we're going to be having a fair for the children in the gym next door and special Purim cookies. And so you're welcome to invite friends and family, especially people that are Jewish. They might really enjoy uh, watching uh, evangelical Christians um, uh, trying to do something that they do all the time. So we'll see how that goes. It should be a lot of fun, I think, for this coming Sunday at 5 o'clock. We're also having our annual church meeting this Sunday evening. We're going to do it at 6.45, so we'll give a little bit of time for parents and people to go watch the children do their little fair, and then we'll come back in, the members of our church and Dayspring students, for our annual meeting of our church. Uh, we're also excited about our Easter service. Uh, we have a lot of incredible music. Uh, there is uh, uh, videos that we're making, music. You see the stage is... Uh, we're adding things. It's going to be a packed stage with choirs, and I'll be preaching a message on the resurrection, and then we also have a big children's program that day as well. So March 31st, 11 o'clock, there's no Sunday school that day, there's no Sunday evening that day. Uh, we're going to put all of our focus and attention on the Easter service, so please, again, promote that. We're also going to be doing something in April. We're going to do a five-week marriage class during our small group time, our Sunday school time, on the Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock in April. So if you're looking for where that is, it's in the lower primary room, and again, it's at 11 o'clock starting April 7th for five Sundays. We're also going to be doing a big anniversary for our addictions ministry, Simple Steps. This is the big 20. 20 years ago... Uh, we had a, a, a passion and a vision to help those that we really didn't know what to do. We knew we, we wanted to help, but we didn't really know how or what to do. And so we started an addictions ministry. It is now our own national ministry where we have 30-some uh, churches uh, here in the United States and in Canada that are running it. And bigger churches, we have a couple big churches that just signed up in uh, Tennessee, I believe, and in Florida. So we're excited about this. We want to make this the biggest addictions program open house we've ever had. April 12th, Friday night, 7 o'clock, fried chicken and baked chicken, if you're so inclined to skip fried chicken. And it's free. The attendance record that we need to break, the biggest we've ever had come out to one of these anniversaries was 271. So we need all of you and a few others to come out and support the Simple Steps Addictions Program open house April 12th, 7 o'clock. Okay? So make sure you put that on the calendar. I'd love, I'll just say this. I will be so disappointed if I don't see you there. Okay? Let's just put it that way. Uh, we've got to make this a big deal. We want the whole church to be, we want... All, there's over 100, I think 130, 140 come regularly to that, and I want, the whole, I want them to feel like the whole church is behind that effort, and it is. And so please, uh, please do that. If we can have the ushers come forward, we'll pray for Israel and the hostages. 
Also, we'll keep in mind uh, Brian Stankus, Dave Muscarella are going to be having uh, surgeries. Uh, also, Jamie Mickish is asking prayer. She's our missionary from Canada. Prayer for some close friends that just found their 14-year-old daughter has leukemia. So let's pray uh, for these, uh, these folks as well as our offering. Lord, we're so thankful to be able to be here in the middle of the week to recharge, to seek you, to speak to you, to sing to you. Father, we do pray right now for uh, Marie Moran as he is still in captivity in Gaza and the more than 100 others, some old, some young, some children, some babies, women. Lord, protect them. Help them. Lord, help Israel to eliminate the terror, eliminate the wickedness of Hamas, protect the soldiers, Lord. We ask for you to bring peace back to the Holy Land and bring peace to Jerusalem. So Father, we pray for that as well as those we've mentioned that need our special prayer, especially the family that Jamie Mickish knows, Lord, help them and help this little girl as she is critical in the next 24 hours that that she improves. Lord, we bring that situation before you and how hard something like that must be. And Father, we are grateful that we have the opportunity to minister not just to this area, but also our entire community, our region, and our world. Lord, help the money we're gonna collect go far and wide for the gospel. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Caden is uh, one of our Dayspring Bible College students, and it's awesome to give them opportunities to bless us and also get trained for ministry. And we're one of the only colleges left that uh, does purely ministry. Colleges, unfortunately, are closing all around the country, and Dayspring is growing. So we praise the Lord for that. We also have some birthdays. Uh, we, we forgot to sing, but I see uh, Rich Anderson. Are you... Older today? Yeah, a little bit. I'm not going to ask how old, but uh, John Vincent is a birthday today. Um, Molly Julian is today. Claire D'Angelo. Wow, we had a lot of people born on this date. Who else today? Anybody else? Birthdays today? How about this week? Today's your birthday? Are you serious? That is so awesome. Good for you. Anybody else? Going one, this is like one of the best altar calls I've ever had. <laughs> That's good. Well, happy birthday, all. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna sing as your birthday gift. I always think it's funny when I hear someone, not funny, but 
ironically funny, when I hear someone say they died doing what they loved. I always think that's code for he did something really stupid. I also hear people say things, and I, I just really hate trendy phrases. I just can't stand them. Uh, living your best life now, or things like that, you know? Or living life to the fullest. Well, that's actually my title, How to Live Life to the Fullest, but it's not in the sense of what the world would usually say. Live your life to the fullest. Live it up. But it's living our lives to the fullest potential of what God wants for us to do, empowered by him. That is living our lives to the fullest. How can we do that? And I'm going to give you four things from our study of the book of Acts that will hopefully highlight these four things that we can have our life full of now and then when we get to heaven, if we know Christ the Savior, then we're going to have a, a wonderful, wonderful experience all, for all eternity knowing that uh, we've got the well done, thou good and faithful servant because we've lived life to the fullest, not for ourselves, but for the Lord. There was a 40-year-old man who had a heart attack, and he was wheeled into surgery, and as he went under, suddenly he was in heaven. And there was the Lord. And the man said, well, I I guess guess this is it. I guess I'm, I'm dead, right? And God said, no, actually, not quite. You're, you're going to live another 10 years. And the man woke up after surgery. He was pretty excited that he had some time left. He was wealthy, so he decided while he was in the hospital, and he had another 10 years, to go ahead and get some work done. So he had the tummy tuck, and he had the the chin and the nose. He actually, while he was in the hospital, had a hairstylist come in and color his hair. He walked out of the hospital after he recovered and was hit by an ambulance. He's in heaven again. He says, Lord, I thought you said I had 10 more years to live. He said, yeah, but we couldn't recognize you. How, when it's our time, how can we know for sure that we've lived our life to the fullest? Well, a lot of people don't even know what a full life really is. And, and as we're studying in the book of Acts in our series, To the Ends of the Earth, we're going to see four things that young Stephen had that would lead me to say he lived a full life. So far, we've learned about the birth of the church, this called out assembly, this ecclesia, this this unique and wonderful mystery of God that has has been revealed of the way that God is working today, which is different than he worked during the time of Israel, which was different than he worked at other times, Salvation's always the same, but the way that the, the message of, of the gospel is given out and the way that we operate in our lives is different today. And in this church age, we've seen the birth of the church in the book of Acts. We've seen this called out assembly that God was using them to bring the good news to a hurting world. We also saw that Jesus had ascended into heaven with the promise of his spirit. The Spirit had arrived in a big way on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast and festival, and the church was growing by the thousands, despite increasing persecution. But so far, no one but Jesus had been put to death. But that is about to change. Last time we saw the solution to a a, a problem. There was a certain group of widows that their needs weren't being met. They didn't have the, the social safety nets that we have. And it was incumbent upon the church to meet the needs 
of these widows. And there was a group of widows, their needs weren't getting met. So the apostles got together and solved the problem in a spiritual way, in a really, I think, smart way, by selecting seven men that were godly to take the work and to do the work in order for these people's needs to be met. These were servants. These were seven deacons. And they were to attend to the physical needs of the body of Christ. And one of those seven, I called them the spectacular seven, and somebody after church, by the way, said, Pastor, that was a spectacular sermon. I don't know that the person was genuine in saying that, but just trying to be funny. And I laughed, and then I cried. But Stephen was spectacular, truly, as we're going to see today. We're going to just see how this Stephen, this young man, lived life to the fullest. So the first thing I want you to think about as we look to making sure we've lived our lives to the fullest, when our time is up, is our lives can be full of faith. Full of faith. Acts 6, we'll start in verse 8 today. And Stephen, full of faith. He lived life to the fullest. And we're going to see, and we have seen, in other verses of Acts 6, that the emphasis of Stephen's life is indeed fullness. Really remarkable, young man. We don't know a lot about him, but what we know about him is pretty impressive. We know from Acts 6, 8 that he was full of faith. We just read that. A few verses earlier in Acts 6, 3, we were told that he was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. What amazing things that are said about Stephen and his life. I wonder if we are full of faith, full of wisdom, full of power, full of the Holy Ghost. If we were, how could that change how we live? How could that change those around us? And how could that change our attitude about death? There's some famous people that said some interesting things about life and death. One was Woody Allen. He said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Someone else said, just when you think there's light at the end of the tunnel, you discover it's a train. Someone else said, live life to the fullest. Think of all the people on the Titanic who passed dessert. That's a little macabre, isn't it? But in Scripture, to be full of means to be controlled by, okay? Stephen was controlled by the Spirit. He was controlled by his faith. He was controlled by wisdom. He was controlled by the power of God. He was full of these things. He was living life to the fullest, wasn't he? He was yielding daily to the Spirit of God, He was controlled by the the Lord. He was seeking to lead people to Christ. It wasn't just enough for for him to, to serve tables, to help these widows. He wanted to also influence people with the gospel. And what was the result of Stephen's faithfulness? God's blessing on an infant church. That blessing continued, that blessing increased. The church was very unified. It was multiplying, it was magnifying God, and God was magnifying the church. It was just incredible what was happening, and Stephen got to be part of that. Also, the last time we studied in the book of Acts, we read in verse seven of chapter six, and it said, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And we wondered, could that be actual, Levitical, Aaronic priests, people that that had come uh, as a, a descendant of the tribe of Levi? 
And, and they, were, they were serving in the temple, and these priests were getting saved. They were believing in Jesus and Yeshua as their Savior. I think that has to be what this means. Remember, the early church was meeting in the upper room, but I think that was getting pretty crowded, and they started to meet in the temple areas. Not in the temple, but in the courtyards. And certainly that had to attract the attention of the priest. And also the priest would have known that the veil of the temple had been torn just a few months earlier when Jesus died. So what a powerful testimony that these people, including Stephen, had on all of Jerusalem, but especially those that were serving in the temple. And when we read a, a, a passage like Acts 6-7 about the word of God increasing and the number of the disciples multiplying and all of that. We're, we're starting to, in literature, understand that there's a bit of a transitioning happening. And Dr. Luke, the author here of the book of Acts, is really good at helping us sense a change in the narrative, a change in the dynamics of what is going on in not only the church but in the community. So we're, we're, we know, we're signaled that there's an important stage that they've reached in the foundation of the early church in Jerusalem. Remember, the church was just in Jerusalem at this time. These are just weeks since the Holy Spirit has come and, and weeks since Jesus has ascended. And the, the, earth is, the, the church is still in its infancy, but it's growing exponentially, and great things are happening. But you start to see a few problems too, don't you? You start to see the, the issue with Ananias and Sapphira. You start to see the issues that were with uh, some of the people in the church not feeling that they were being cared for. You start to see some serious persecution is coming too. But here, Luke is describing the peak of the ministry in Jerusalem. But God didn't want the church, he didn't want the gospel to stay in Jerusalem. He wanted the gospel to emanate from there and cover the entire planet. So the martyrdom of Stephen, we're gonna be getting into that fully next time. The following persecution, I believe, is the catalyst that sends the gospel. Sometimes. What seems so horrible, oh, this incredible young man, Stephen, is gonna be killed, and there's gonna be persecution? We don't want that, no, Lord, don't let that happen. And when God does allow something, we, we just think, there's, why would he allow that? He is, he's not nice, he's not good, he's just allowed something horrible in my life. What if it is for a greater good? Like getting the gospel out of Jerusalem into the further reaches. And that's exactly what happens because of Stephen and his uh, martyrdom and the persecution that is rising. The gospel is forced out of Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So, Which is really interesting to me that God allows certain things for something that he knows and we don't really understand. Up to this point, the apostles and Jesus were the only ones performing miracles, but God also gave the power to others, including Stephen. How do we know? Well, that's our second point. Our lives should not just be full of faith, but our lives should also be full of power. Now, I'm not saying that you have the power to perform a miracle, although that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? If Benny Hinn really had the power to heal, why wouldn't he clear out the hospitals? You know, I wish we did. I wish the, 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 the gift, the, the, the sign gift of healing were still operational because I would just spend all day healing people. But it was operational because God was saying there's something special happening with this group of people. It was a stamp of approval upon this church. And not only did the apostles have this Ability, but now Stephen, we see, does. It says in Acts 6, 8, we continue. It said that Stephen had, was full of faith, but also power. He was full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. I don't know how old Stephen was, but I don't think he was an, an older man. I would say he was a younger man. And there he was, doing miracles. 
And then it says in verse 9, then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. <laughs> now, let's just stop a second and ask ourselves, who in the world are these Libertines and Cyrenians, and who are, who are these people? Well, the simple explanation is that Jews had been scattered, and often because of persecution, but sometimes Jewish people would just move for business reasons and other things. And, and the, the Jews from many nations had come back to Jerusalem and were living in Jerusalem, and you know how you have a certain accent or culture, you know, you, you pick up some of the things from the different areas, and so they had their own synagogues. Each of these groups, these, they're all Jewish, but they're, they're just a little different than the others, and, and they have their own synagogues. And I think that's what this was. And, and I kind of actually find a little solace that there are even today many divisions in Judaism. So when people say, well, you know, Christianity can't be true because you have so many interpretations, so many divisions, so many different denominations, well, I think that's just human nature, right? Uh, some of it's doctrinal, theological, but some of it's just we, we like to do something a certain way. And this, the, the Jewish people were no different, and they had different traditions and interpretations, and they had their own synagogues. So who are the libertines? Well, libertine means free man or freed man. So some people think that this was a group of people that had been previously enslaved by Rome but had been freed, and they were there in Jerusalem as a subcultural subgroup of freedmen, descendants of Jews that had earlier been enslaved and won their freedom from Rome. But others think this is, and they, this is actually for sure a real town, a real area called Libertina. It's in modern Tunisia in North Africa. So whether or not they are just a subgroup of freed slaves that are Jewish, that are in Jerusalem and they want their own synagogue, or they came from, like the rest of these are places, they came from a place in North Africa. The Cyrenians were from the Mediterranean coast of modern Libya, so another North African town. They would have come from there. They would have had their synagogue. The Alexandrians, we know Alexandria, Egypt, right? That's where they would have been from there on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt. It's really interesting to me that most of these encircle the Mediterranean. Uh, Cilicia is the Mediterranean coastal city in modern Turkey. And what's also interesting about Cilicia, Paul, the apostle, came from Tarsus, which was in Cilicia. And so could it be possible, follow my logic here, could it be possible that Saul, who would later be Paul, heard Stephen in his synagogue the, of the Cilicians. It's possible. We don't know that for sure, but it's very possible. We know that Paul hated Christianity, hated Christians, and was doing everything he could to stop them by persecuting them, arresting them, and killing them. And he was there at Stephen's martyr, uh, stoning, martyrdom. So, that's conjecture, but it's possible. And then it also says Asia. We always think of Asia as the east, the far east, but this would have been probably the uh, area of modern Turkey, the, the western part of Turkey, Turkey there, what we would call maybe Asia Minor. So these are the different areas that these different Jews had returned to Jerusalem, and they had their own synagogues. Stephen was a soul winner. He wasn't content just to be a server and a, uh, a servant in the church and helping people, and that's important, and that's good, but that's not life. That's not the fullest life. What's the fullest life? To get engaged with people that need to hear the message of hope. And boy, did he do a good job. It says that all those that were disputing with Stephen were no match for his wisdom, his power, and the spirit of his words. It says that in verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. 
Now, some people think, well, I, I, I don't have that. I, 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 I'm so afraid to talk to people. I wonder if Stephen didn't have that naturally. I wonder if he just loved the Lord so much, he wanted to tell everybody about the Lord, and he just, the Lord helped me do this. I think that's really what witnessing is. It's like, I don't think any of us are like, boy, I'm so naturally good at talking to people and answering people's questions. Also, I think sometimes we, we overthink it a little bit. All we really need to do is be excited about the Lord and the message of the gospel. We don't have to have every answer. I also know that there are actually only a few objections to faith in Jesus. People think there's all these hundreds of things that I have to learn to answer every question. There's probably only five or 10. Once you know that, you're gold, and, and the Lord can help you with that. I saw a video clip from the uh, talk show host, Bill Maher. Bill is usually a vulgar man. It's not someone that I would normally watch, but in this clip, it was talking about Jesus. And so I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what he had to say. And he was speaking disparagingly about Jesus and about the Gospels. He said that all the authors of the Gospels lived many years after Jesus lived. None of them knew Jesus. It was all from second or third hand accounts. It was, he said it was like a game of telephone, where the, at, by the end of the game of telephone, you have nothing like what originally was said. And I was like, and his guest didn't really, his guest was kind of a, maybe a new believer and didn't really have any good answers. And I'm like screaming at the screen. No, 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 no. Two of them were with Jesus. Like that first hand account. Like how would he not know that? So we have, we have the answers. I think those of you that are faithful in church and faithful in study, you've, you're, you have a lot of answers that very, very few people have. And, and I think that you can be like Stephen. I was, just, I was just wishing that Stephen could have been Bill Maher's guest and, and what that would have been like. We need more Stevens. We need more Stephanies. We need more people that are full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom. Even if you don't have it naturally, you know more than you think you know and God will make up the difference. We all could do it. In Luke 21, in verse 15, the Bible says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in witnessing opportunities where I literally am surprised at what came out of my mouth. Really, I'm like, oh, that was pretty good. But I, I, like, I didn't come up with it. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing what God can do, or the recall maybe, or the a good answer that he, he gives you in the time. So don't be afraid. Stephen was full of faith, full of power, but there were people that opposed him. And these people were full of confusion. It's really sad when I see the confusion that is in our culture today. I read a story that a woman in Alaska was shocked to find a biological man shaving in the woman's dressing room and shower area inside her local Planet Fitness. She goes to the manager. The manager says, well, if this man feels like he's a woman, then we're not gonna discriminate. We wanna encourage that. It's fine for him to be in there. She complains to the national office. They said the same thing, and they issued this statement. As the home of Judgment Free Zone, Planet Fitness is committed to creating an inclusive environment. Our gender identity non-discrimination policy states that members and guests may use the gym facilities that best align with their sincere, self-reported gender identity. And in this Judgment Free Zone of Planet Fitness, they canceled this woman's membership. Well, they do judge, don't they? What's the problem with this? Well, obviously, it's gonna to lead to serious sexual crime. It's just awful. It's, it's just the world is so confused, and I just think of, of how confusing people are these days because they're not hearing truth, and we have truth, and we can share truth with people. 
not just on gender identity, of course that to me is such a basic thing, but on the gospel. Start with the gospel. Give the gospel to people that are trans, to people that are homosexual. Give the gospel. That's the only thing that's gonna help any of us to people that are adulterers, thieves. I mean, think about all of the things that are part of this world, and the gospel is the answer to every one of them. So our lives should be full of faith, our lives should be full of power, but our lives may also still be full of pain. You say, hold on a second. You're saying that I should be full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and and be able to answer people's questions and not only serve the Lord in the church, but also go out there in the community and, and, and help people and give the gospel, and my life is still gonna be full of pain, or it can be? Yeah, yeah, it's just part of it. If, if this happened to our master, why would we think any different? Why would we think that we can avoid suffering if he suffered so much? So number three, our lives may still be full of pain, Acts 6, 11. And they suborned men. So what does that mean? That means an old English word that means to, they introduced people to collude. Uh, they, it, it, it's really similar. When you start to read Acts 6, 11 through 14, it sounds very similar to what happened to Jesus. They didn't really have any real evidence Anything really against Stephen, so they colluded. They made this up. These people in the synagogue that were disputing Stephen, he had such good answers, it shut their mouths. So, okay, they suborned other people, and they said, this is their accusation. We heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. That sounds so much like Jesus, doesn't it? And you know what? He actually, just a few months later, is in front of the same council that Jesus was in front of and set up false witnesses. Wow, this is so eerie, so similar, which said, This man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, referring to the temple. Of course, they had just lost some of the priests. They weren't too happy about that. And the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So he's against God. He's against Moses He's for this imposter Jesus. Those who oppose God often parrot the same things over and over. That's why I said don't be afraid of objections to Christianity. Once you talk to a few people, you'll be surprised at how it's always the same things. Like uh, you can't trust the Gospels because nobody that wrote the Gospels were actually part of Jesus' life. That's, it's not true. And those that weren't with Jesus, the two Gospel writers that weren't with him, had very close contact to people that were. And so, and that, those were cross-checked. It wasn't like it came through 10 people. They, they were nearly direct accounts as well. Of course, the resurrection, I think, is the cornerstone of the fact that all of this is true. So anyways, the same thing is happening to Stephen, and again, if you know how to answer five or 10 questions, you're almost always gonna be able to stump. Even if Bill Maher invites you on, I say, go do it. Go do it. He's like, no, I would never do it. I probably wouldn't do it either. But boy, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? To be, to be able to answer those, those, those questions. Uh, Matthew 26, let's, let's read about what happened to Jesus in verse 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. This is exactly the same thing, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the, same, at, at the last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. He didn't say that either. He said the temple would be destroyed, but he's saying this temple 
is going to be destroyed, his body, and he would rise again. That's what he was talking about. So Stephen, facing the same spiritual blindness that Jeremiah faced in Jeremiah's ministry, in Jeremiah 7, verse 8, it says, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense and a bale, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do these abominations? These are the, uh, not the same people, but they have the similar mentality, don't they? Maybe they weren't going after false gods by this time, by the time of Jesus, but they weren't accepting the truth, were they? So the church faced opposition. And, and this would, by the way, continue for many years. When you read the book of Acts, when we get to Acts 15, and you also read some of the other epistles, like the epistle to the Galatians, you're going to read that the 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 Jewish people that, that were attacking Christianity were attacking both from within and from without. And, and I'm not saying this to say that we should be against the Jewish people. We should not. Why? Because they brought us the Savior. We should love them. We should support them as a, a nation. We should, we should oppose anti-Semitism. We should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There's a blessing for that. We should share the love that God has given us to our Jewish friends. But there were certain Jewish people that were attacking Christianity. In Acts 15, 1, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. We know that's wrong. How do we know that's wrong? Because Abraham was saved before he was circumcised. It wasn't even a thing yet. So salvation is also by faith. It's uh, trusting Jesus Christ as Savior, and that's it. So you don't have to have these rituals. We don't have to have these other things to be saved. And so there was a whole long, the whole passage of Acts 15 is, to, is counter, countering that, uh, these Jewish people saying you had to be circumcised. And the end result of the Jerusalem Council was that no. No, the salvation is free. Just believe. And then in Galatians 2, you see the attacks from without in verse 4, that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberties which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So you have this problem from within and from without, and they needed to protect that. And they, they did. Adam Clark is a commentator, and he was writing in the time of England when there was a lot of pushback against the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm just going to read a quote that he said, because I think it's applicable to what we're just talking about. He said, In the reign of Queen Mary, when popery prevailed in this country, and the slightest woman who had read the Bible were an overmatch for the greatest of the popish doctors, as they had neither scripture nor reason to allege, they burned them alive thus terminating a controversy which they were unable to maintain. That was exactly what's about to happen to Stephen. A young man who hadn't been trained, who hadn't been part of this austere group of lawyers and religious leaders was schooling them. So what do you do? You take them out. And that's what the Catholic Church did and that's what is about to happen here to Stephen. So while Stephen was ministering full of faith, full of power, full of miracles, and the Spirit, he was arrested and brought before the same council that had only months before tried Jesus, our lives may be full of pain. But that's not bad. It's not bad. Number four, our lives ought to be full of wonder. Wonder. Now, this is really cool. Acts 6.15, all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, so he'd just been falsely accused, in the next chapter, he's going to preach the most amazing sermon. I can't wait to, to, to preach Stephen's sermon next time. They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Wow. I love this. Stephen hadn't even opened his mouth. But his face 
was speaking volumes, wasn't it? This glow of his face told everyone that this young man was a servant of God. And if the Sanhedrin knew their scriptures as they should have, I think they may have thought back to Exodus 34. Maybe they were, they were thinking back to Moses and Moses' face shining when he got off the, the mountain, Mount Sinai, with the tablets. And when Aaron, in verse 30, and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. They had just accused Stephen of co contradicting Moses, and now Stephen's face is shining like Moses. This is God. This had to come back on them. They had to have thought of that. God is speaking without saying a word. You accuse this servant of mine to be against Moses? He is not against Moses. As a matter of fact, he is like Moses. He is my faithful servant. Oh, how wonderful that must have been as Stephen, just in his face, was full of wonder. There was once a blind man sitting at night on the corner of a large city, and he had a lantern glowing. And someone came along and said, why would you, as a blind person, need a lantern? As you can't see. Night and day is no difference to you. And this poor blind man said, I want to have this light to make sure no one trips over me. I think that's how we live our life to the fullest. To make sure that we don't trip anybody up and to make sure that we're a light to help our fellow man find the light of the world. While one man may read the Bible, hundreds will read you and me. And I think that's what Paul meant when he said in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. The way we live matters. Dale Moody said, I would not give much for all that can be done by sermons if we do not preach Christ by our lives. Both the witness of our mouth and the witness of our lives are equally important to share Jesus with the world. So, live life to the fullest by serving the Lord, like Stephen. Have you put your trust, your faith in Jesus? Did you know that he came to die for your sins? God in the flesh died for you? It says in Ephesians 2, verse 8, that it's by grace that we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. Lest any man should boast. For you to be saved from your sins, all you have to do is understand that you're a sinner and put your faith, your trust, believe in Jesus, the Son of God, who died for your sin. He paid for your sin. He was put into the ground, but the ground couldn't hold him. For in three days, he arose. The resurrection means it's all true. And these people that you're watching on these clips, once you start talking about the resurrection, they get very nervous, because it really all hinges upon that. If he rose again, it's all true. If you're skeptical, if you're at least an honest skeptic, research it, study it, think about it, read about it. There's answers, there's truth in this world. There's hope because of the resurrection of Jesus, and I hope that you can share that with as many people as possible. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just go in there, say, Lord, I'm afraid, but I know this is right. I want to do this. I want to be like Stephen. I want, to, I want to live life to the fullest. I'm going to share this with people, and just give me the words, give me the answers, and you'll be surprised what God can do. Please bow as we close in prayer. Before I pray, though, let me ask you this. Do you remember when you've put your faith in Jesus? If you don't remember that time, do it right now. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself, but right now, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. I trust in him. And if you've done that, the Bible says that you're saved. You're saved forever. Lord, how wonderful it is to know your word and the truth of it and, and the beauty of it and how, how our lives can be a sermon, how our lives can be a testimony. And Lord, we're so grateful for a dedicated young man like Stephen. I think our church is full of dedicated young people. 
And Lord, I ask a blessing upon them, protect them, help them, strengthen them, even when we're going through hard times. Lord, help us to know that it's for a greater, a greater thing. You don't allow anything in the life of a believer that's gonna ultimately harm us. You only allow things in our lives that's ultimately gonna help us and bring you glory. So help us trust in that. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scudder, for that. As we close, would you please stand? Let's be that light. Let's be that light that leads people to Jesus this week. On our way out, let's grab those What Is My Value card and the Easter cards. Grab those. Let's get those in people's hands that we can have a, a packed house for Easter, but then also be able to impact them with the gospel this week and then the next week as we celebrate Easter. As we close, sing with me, Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Before you leave, not everyone was here at the beginning of the service, so I, I think it's appropriate that we at least sing happy birthday to a few of the people, right? Molly thought she was going to get out of it, but I can't. But was it Tammy or Kelly that had the birthday? I saw you point to somebody. It was Kelly. Kelly, Rich, Claire, John, and Molly. All right, did I get everybody? All right. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, John, Rich, Claire, Kelly, and Molly. We got everybody. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Give them a hand. Have a great week. We'll see you Sunday morning.